If you're at school or starting out at uni and you're interested in going into research, it can be difficult to see how you get from the level that you're at to the level of a researcher, like a professor or a lecturer or a PhD student. The thing to remember, of course, is that you're comparing yourself to somebody who's got years of experience, who's done possibly dozens of works of research in their career. And it's like starting a video game and you're comparing your character that you've just made to the character of somebody who's been playing for years and has leveled up and has got lots of sweet loot. In the beginning, their character was just like yours. In this video, suggested by Sonia Vukatic, I'm really sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, in the comments on a previous video, I'm going to take you through my levelling process and talk you through all the works of research that I did in my career that took me from being a level 1 scrub to a level 80 well, PhD student. If you're a researcher or a PhD student watching this, then please, if you're comfortable to do so, do comment down there with your research story, with the research projects that you've done along the way and how you feel like you've developed on your levelling process. My research story begins in my starting area, which was my school, and my first quest, I guess, in this framework, which was my extended project qualification, or EPQ, which I did in year 12 on manned missions to Mars and why they're so much more difficult than manned missions to the moon. This was the first time that I'd worked towards a qualification that was uh, outside of a set syllabus. Like, there was a syllabus that you had to hit uh, and certain things you had to do in order to get, you know, given a certain grade, but I was allowed to pick what I wanted to research and that was really cool. Um, I think almost immediately I latched onto this idea that if I had an idea, I could pursue it. I could actually pursue what I'm interested in rather than just, you know, following what someone else tells me to do. Maybe that was what kind of kicked me off into doing research as a career. I was trusted to work on my own completely independently, um, plan my own time, plan how I was going to write the whole thing up, plan even how I was going to structure it. Literally from beginning to end it was my baby and I really loved that process. And I also enjoyed the process of supervision where you were doing the work yourself but you had uh, somebody who was experienced in the field, well not in the field of manned missions to Mars, but somebody who was experienced in the field of education who could help you with writing it up and advise you, but not tell you what to do, just give you a helping hand along the way. And I feel like I much preferred that relationship in education to just being taught. So again, maybe that's something else that sort of kick-started me down doing academia, uh, which is just as well, because it only got more and more frequent as the years went on. So that first project basically taught me how to be a student outside of a curriculum and outside of school and to follow what I was interested in. And elements of that came in really useful in my second research project. So I, uh, between the two events, I got into Oxford. I did two years of studying physics at Oxford, and then in the summer of my second year, I got an internship at an engineering company in which I was investigating failures of light-emitting diodes so these tiny electrical components that they'd have, I think, four failures out of 10,000 products sold. So it wasn't exactly a pressing issue, but they wanted to investigate it. So approaching the whole thing like a scientist, I came up with a hypothesis, which was that the product that the LEDs were being used in was running too hot, and that that was what was causing the failure. So I constructed an experiment, I designed this thing which we built in the lab, uh, where we heated a, a dye which we knew was working, uh, and looked at the spectrum that it produced, so to determine whether the temperature affected the spectrum. And so if we looked at the, the four failed products that we had, if the spectrum emitted by the LEDs in them was different to what we you know, saw from an optimal product, which it was, but in a way that wasn't consistent with the data that I got from my experiment. So we ruled out the idea that it was a temperature problem. So in a way, the research project was a failure, but it kind of wasn't. A null result is still a result. Um, you know, it's something to cross off the list. And more importantly, from my perspective, it was a real thrill to, again, be given the autonomy, but to be able to design a whole experiment to say, this is a, a problem, Here's a hypothesis. Let's let's work it out. You know, to actually take the idea that you you know you learn in like year seven to say uh, hypothesis, observations, analysis, conclusions, and evaluations, and actually translate that into a real life experiment that I designed and I ran. That was amazing. The experience was also useful in another way because it taught me that uh, I didn't want to work in that kind of role. Uh, working for the company was fine. You know, the people were lovely, but I couldn't see myself working, you know, in a nine-to-five job, uh, just churning out in some soulless machine. Um, it wasn't for me. So that kind of pushed me further down the road of academia. And the really crucial step came in my third research project. So I'd levelled up some more. Um, I was a year older. I'd done a year more of physics, so I gained a couple more levels, specifically levelling up uh, atmospheric physics. 
so um, I got a first in the module at Oxford doing um, geophysical fluid dynamics, which was what I eventually ended up specialising in. And I emailed a bunch of professors at the university saying, look, I'm interested in doing a PhD, possibly. I want to see if it's for me. So do you have any work that I could do over the, the summer break um, that would be useful to you? And, you know, it would allow me to see what doing a PhD is like. Very fortunately, a researcher in the Middle Atmosphere group came back to me and was like, yeah, I've got a project you can work on, uh, which was basically replicating the results uh, of a scientific paper and uh, running the analysis again, but instead of using data from the actual atmosphere, like from satellites, we were working with data from various climate models. So we were trying to, to work out which models captured this behaviour that we were investigating. Which, if you're interested, was the phase synchronisation of the quasi-biennial and the semi-annual oscillations in the middle atmosphere. And doing this project did a lot of things for me. Firstly, it confirmed that I wanted to do a PhD. Secondly, it was my first real foray into learning how to program. Um, I had previously done a little bit of C, and in my second research project I did some work in um, Excel, which you should never do for data analysis. This time around I taught myself IDL, which was the programming language that the original program for the uh, analysis from real climate data was written in. Uh, and it's not something I've used since, but it was my first foray into real scientific programming, so it was an immensely useful skill to take on that early. It was also my first real experience reading scientific literature, so reading a scientific paper and knowing how it's broken up, what the language is like, uh, what the figures are like, um, and sort of just getting used to how things are done. Which became useful because um, the after the work was done, I wrote it up into a scientific paper, um, which was a, like the full length of the paper that we were going to submit to a journal. We ended up not submitting it because my supervisor, kind of rightly, I hate to admit it, uh, wasn't totally happy because in our analysis where we ran the original data through, we got a wiggle in a graph, a very small wiggle that wasn't there in the first place. Um, and so he was reluctant to publish it. But... I did get to present the work at a conference in Germany, so that was another first. And the whole concept of rejecting it because of a tiny quibble definitely taught me a lot about academic rigour. And while it taught me a lot about managing your time and not getting stressed if you turn up at 10 rather than 9 because you're in charge of your own time, you just stay until 6 instead of 5. And it taught me about working independently and managing data and learning how like programming uh, and computing structures work at, at universities. The most important thing that this research project taught me was that I wanted to do a PhD. Like From that perspective, it was a total success. I was like, yeah, I love the autonomy. I love being able to uh, you know, choose what I do on a daily basis. I'm given a project with a little bit of supervision, who my supervisor would meet you know, once or twice a week. I go to his office and just sort of talk through what I was doing. I loved it. I, I, I totally fell for the lifestyle. I knew it was what I wanted to do. But before I could do a PhD, I had to do my master's project, which uh, was my fourth year at Oxford, so only a couple of levels more that I picked up over the over that quest. Uh, and uh, my master's project was on linear stochastic models of global climate, which are a terrible idea. I mean, my master's thesis basically went, can you build a linear stochastic model of climate? And the answer was yes, but it's awful. In many ways, this project was like a carbon copy of the one I'd just done. I had to learn another programming language, which was MATLAB. Um, I had to learn how to submit tasks to a central computer server rather than running them locally. Um, you know, lots of sort of computer bits and bobs that they you wouldn't learn otherwise. And it also taught me to write up in a scientific format again. Instead of a paper this time, though, it was a master's thesis, which... I think off the top of my head was like 40 pages long, so it, it was quite a meaty thing. And I also had to defend that thesis in a mini viva, uh, which was a conversation with two academics. Uh, and I remember distinctly being asked a question and just totally freezing and doing the classic, oh, can you, can you repeat that question? Sorry, I didn't quite catch it. When I full well heard it, I just wanted more time to think about it. So I guess it taught me something about academic skullduggery as well. But this was like another step improvement, like a small increment. I was getting slightly better at programming and slightly better at doing um, the maths that was involved and working with the computing, working with a research team and, you know, submitting reports to the supervisor and then actually my supervisor's boss because I was now working within like a research group structure with other researchers, which were all fantastically useful skills to have because I ended up doing a PhD here at Exeter. So this is my biggest and most recent quest. And actually this... This is like my quest log. Um, this is the plan for my thesis. 
ignore chapter five, I'm working on it. And doing a PhD relies on all the skills that I've learned up until now. And really quite importantly, it's not just one big project. Um, the whole point of doing this organization structure was to break down the PhD into smaller sub-projects and see how they fit together. Because it's a three or four year, now more commonly, qualification where you will do little sub-research projects. Um, because a PhD generally has two to three scientific papers worth of content in it, you will inevitably do sort of lots of bits of analysis that don't always fit kind of together. There has to be a structure separating them. And also, some of those projects are going to be failures. I spent the best part of a year working on something that isn't going to go in my thesis because it just turned out we couldn't solve this particular equation. We don't actually know if it is possible, but I didn't have the time to solve it. So it's only through doing those sub-projects where you have tried and failed and you've implemented all the skills that you've used, you know, from stretching right the way back to year 12, um, that you can start planning a thesis and you can start, you know, considering getting that final qualification. And that was the point I wanted to make with this video, that the skills necessary to be told that you're going to write a 200 page document about original scientific research and not find that terrifying only come after years of incremental improvements and learning through other research projects. Nobody's born able to do it, which means that with dedication, the right qualifications and a hell of a lot of time and effort, you can do it too. Now, as I mentioned at the start, this is only my story. If you're a researcher, please do comment down there with the story that you've gone on and the dragons you've slain along the way. Because, I mean, I'll be interested to hear from you, but I think it's important to show the audience that there's no one way to become a researcher. There's no one correct uh, order to learn all these skills in. That there's lots of different paths to becoming a PhD student or a professor. Thank you to Sonia for suggesting this video idea. Thank you for watching, and if you did enjoy it, consider giving it a like or a share. And if you have any suggestions about topics that you'd like me to talk about when it comes to academia and you know doing a PhD, please feel free to suggest those down in the comments as well. Thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next video.